All right. Well, uh, we've come a long way. We started in concepts of computer science, data representations and XML and databases and so on, compression. We've talked about uh, the use of genetic technologies and microarray technology, sequencing and, and microarray technologies for recognizing sequence variants and looking at those in GWAS. And uh, in our third lecture yesterday, we talked an awful lot about how we make sense of new sequences. How do we uh, assemble them out of genomic database, uh, at genetic reads, and how we annotate them, how we figure out where genes are and try to assert um, what, what, what functions we, we can attribute to those sequences. Um, but today, we're moving to gene expression. And I hope that this morning's practical on uh, making sense of microarray data was useful in sort of getting your hands on what these data look like. But with this talk, we're going to cover a lot of the theory behind gene expression uh, and understanding some of the, the inward systems that we rely upon to make sense of uh, gene expression data sets. So we'll, we'll start with a little bit of discussion of microarrays. This is a very microarray heavy talk. But I want you to keep in mind that we talk about microarrays a lot because that's where the bioinformatics for dealing with gene expression was largely framed. We, do, we, we have systems, of course, that we use for making sense of RNA-seq, but much of that is, uh, is built out of the frameworks that we created initially for microarrays. So we will, uh, we will start with a lot of talk about microarrays uh, particularly and talk about what kinds of experiments are, uh, are best explored using uh, these techniques. And from there, we will talk about high throughput sequencing um, with uh, very much less emphasis, actually. But we're going to spend a fair bit of time in the space of how we make sense of the data from microarrays. This overview slide is probably a little, claims a bit heavier on, on what we're going to do with sequencing than what, what actually happens. So let's start with the idea that in biology, gene expression is very, very heavily regulated. Regulation of, genetic, of gene expression was a, a regular class that we took uh, at, uh, at Vanderbilt in the inter interdisciplinary graduate program. Uh, because understanding how biological systems control themselves is very important to understanding why they operate the way that they do. So um, I don't want you to think that, uh, you, you, may have, you may have seen some papers that came out of the ENCODE effort a few years back that said essentially all parts of the genome have some amount of gene expression going on, even if they're not protein coding genes, um, even if they're not really documented to be features of any particular sort. Um, in, in reality, building transcripts is an energy expenditure on the part of the cells, and they're not going to do a lot of expression for no purpose whatsoever. So, uh, so this regulation is something that we may recognize in response to single mutations, that a single mutation of an, uh, of an individual gene may have a lot of knock-on effects, a lot of downstream regulations on other, uh, on other potential transcripts that could be produced. That in response to stimuli, we see a lot of, a lot of changes in, in this. So if you treat a bunch of cancer cells in a plate with, uh, with an anti-cancer drug, you're going to see changes not just in one gene, but in lots of genes that respond to these, these stimuli. Different developmental stages, certainly if you uh, look at C. elegans, for example, the, the worm, and, and ask uh, what genes are turned on at a given moment in development, you're going to see quite a, quite a shift. Uh, different cell types. You know, we, we have the same genome in our skin fibroblasts as we do in our cell nuclei, uh, in, in uh, our white blood cell nuclei, as we do in our neurons. But those three cell types have completely different gene expression signatures. So we, although it's, it is correct to think of the genome as being basically the one genome throughout the, throughout the, the organism, what genes get expressed, what I, I like to say what, uh, which products get ordered from the catalog changes from tissue to tissue. So uh, the other case is, of course, disease states versus health, healthy. And this is one of the things that has, been, uh, that has led to so many biomarker hunts uh, that, that we want to be able to detect at as early stage as possible people who are becoming ill so there's still time to treat them. Okay, 
So the number of messenger RNA copies that we have in the cell for a particular gene is an indicator of the corresponding protein expression level. This might seem obvious, right? If you have a lot of micro, sorry, if you have a lot of messenger RNA for a particular gene, you should have lots and lots of protein. And you shouldn't ever see cases where you have piles and piles of transcripts and very, very small amounts of protein. This is, in fact, incorrect. This is incorrect. When we look at the, the gene expression by transcripts, uh, by, by transcripts in cells and compare those to the amount of protein that we have for the same gene, we frequently find a very low degree of correlation, like 0.3, right? That's kind of surprising. This is not negative, right? We're not saying that the more transcript you have, the less protein you have. But you can't simply say just because there's a lot of transcript, there's a lot of protein. So there are a couple of things I'd point out in connection with that. The first of these is that you may have microRNA present. And microRNA can attach to transcripts and prevent them from being translated. This is another example of gene regulation. Right? Just because the transcript gets generated does not mean it's going to be translated effectively. The next thing is that proteins have different uh, longevities. You, you, you may have a protein that has a high turnover, which is to say that we generate this protein, but then once it's done its function, we chew it up and it's all, it's all gone. So something like that would, be a, would mean that what, what, that you have a very quick effect, that if you have a lot of transcripts, now you have a lot of that protein, but as soon as the transcript flow go, goes away, the proteins are all digested up and that's the end of it. So they're, they're the, the protein turnover and the post-transcriptional regulation of transcripts by microRNAs are just two examples of reasons why the amount of transcript that you see for a gene is not a direct predictor of the amount of protein that you have for that gene. Okay? This is actually something that, that's been emerging over the last few years. And uh, my, my work with CPTAC, uh, the, the, clinical, uh, the clinical proteomics people with the National Cancer Institute, really helped open my eyes to the fact that these numbers are not so very predictive. You know, if you want to understand the, the function, the, what's happening functionally in the cell, uh, assuming that you can do everything with a sequencer is a real mistake. Proteomics really does have a key role in that respect. Okay, so it's important, I think, to talk about two diagrams and understand the differences between them. So I'm going to show you an operon expression from uh, a prokaryotic organism, and I'm going to show you gene expression from eukaryotic organisms. These differ in a lot of ways, so it's, it's really very much worth your, your understanding the difference between the two. So we start with what is sometimes called a polycystronic, polycystronic transcript. So in a lot, of, a lot of the microbes with which we work, we see that, oh my goodness, this is really not level at all, is it? Is that giving anyone else fits? Here we go. That makes me feel better. I hope that's better for you too. Are we still in focus? No. That seems in focus to me. Okay. I left the stick over here. Okay. It's not straight? <laughs> well, you're right. You're just right. Tell you what, we'll pull the books out from beneath it. It's going to be a little low as a result. Alright. Is that alright? Better? Okay, thank you. So, polycystronic transcripts. These, this is a prokaryotic trick, so something you might see with M. smegmatis or something with M. tuberculosis. We have enhancers and operators and promoters. I'm not going to really dwell on what those do, but uh, these, are, these are responsible for the pre-transcriptional regulation of this, of this gene. We have our untranslated reason, regions. But I want you to note that we have two different ORFs here. What is an ORF? Open reading frame. Open reading frame. OK, that's good. But what does an ORF mean? Is it not the 
It is not the region that is transcribed, it's the region that is translated. So in, in one reading frame of these, uh, of these transcripts, there's a, a long stretch in which many, many codons code for amino acids, not for a stop codon. So the open reading frame stretches from a start codon to a stop codon, a terminator. So there are three different codons that we might see for the, uh, for the stop codon, and one we always see, generally speaking, for the start of translation. So an open reading frame relates to the production of one polypeptide. I didn't say protein, I said polypeptide because they're slightly different, but I'm just trying to be a little hyper accurate here. So what we get is one piece of transcript, one messenger RNA, that codes for multiple proteins. One transcript, multiple, multiple polypeptides. Frequently you find that there's a functional similarity among the genes that are coded together in, this, in, in a polycystronic transcript. So it might be that these two genes are successive steps in a biochemical pathway, for example. That's one possibility. So two independent peptide, uh, polypeptides being coded for by a single transcript. Gesundheit. I thought you had a question at first. You had a very questioning look. All right. So is there, is there a difference between the transcript that is generated uh, from the DNA and the one that reaches the, the ribosome? Did we draw one? We didn't. We have a strand of DNA that gives rise to a transcript that gives rise through translation to the proteins. So here we don't, we don't really have that difference between a pre-messenger RNA and the final um, mRNA. It's one piece of DNA. So we don't generally see tricks like that in the eukaryotic proteome. We, sorry, in the eukaryotic transcriptome. In eukaryotes, we have no polycystronic uh, production of proteins, but we do have multiple kinds of transcripts to deal with. We have the pre-messenger RNA that I mentioned earlier today. So this is the initial transcript as produced through transcription. And we have a, a, a transcriptional processing that changes our pre-messenger RNA to a, mess, uh, to a mature mRNA. We have just one gene product that we're going to produce here. It's not polycystronic. And we have a second thing going on. There are introns coded within this transcript that we have to get rid of. So we're going to have to create these splice junctions that we talked about earlier to make, uh, to make exons about the appropriate following exon to produce some isoform, some transcript associated with this gene. In prokaryotes, you have one transcript, you're going to get the same gene products from this gene every time. But here, you may see different shuffling going on, different, different transcript processing that leads to multiple possible transcripts from an individual gene. So we have a messenger RNA, a, a mature messenger RNA, and it codes for exactly one polypeptide. And yet there may be multiple possible transcripts that all start from this same pre-mRNA. Does everyone see the key differences there between, uh, between the, uh, the prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcriptional mechanisms? Okay. On we go. Oh, yes, question. Yeah. Could you please explain from the X and the Oh, sure. It's, it's not a really... Uh, this is not a complex example, right? So imagine that we have exon A, exon B, and exon C. All right, so let us imagine, it's not really shown in this diagram, but imagine that exon A was joined with exon B, which ended in a stop codon. Okay, so you'd have a product, a, a messenger RNA then, that was 
X on A and B only. But imagine an alternative shuffling of those exons that, that put together X on A and X on C, which ends in a stop code. So now both transcripts would contain region A, they both contained X on A, but they would differ in whether they contained X on B or X on C. So in this case, we would have two different products that could be produced from one, uh, one uh, pre-mRNA. Does that make sense? When you have more than three exons, things get really complex in how many different possible transcripts you could produce. How does that affect the protein that comes out? Okay, well, you know about codons. Okay, so if you have, say, A, B, I'm, I'm imagining that B ends in a stop here. It doesn't have to, of course, but it's not shown that way. But you would have the same codons throughout exon A, but the last codon, if it's incomplete in, the, in exon A, may produce a different amino acid by its, by its gap junction with B than it does in a gap junction between A and C. And of course, an AB transcript is going to have probably completely different amino acids in, throughout exon B than it would have throughout exon C. The protein lengths are going to be different as drawn here because exon C is really long compared to exon B. So not only will you have different regions of shared and non-shared sequence, you may also have different overall lengths of transcript and thus proteins. Okay, I hope that's useful. I, I, this is something we may not spend a lot of time thinking about, but it's uh, w when you're understanding transcription, you, you need to know um, all of those little ins and outs. Okay, so high throughput transcriptome profiling. We want to crank through a whole pile of samples, and for each, we want to be able to measure that transcriptome. As I've mentioned, transcriptome goes by a lot of other names as well. So when you see functional genomics, people are generally talking about the transcriptome. When people talk about gene expression, again, they're talking about the transcriptome in most cases. So I, I would keep those synonyms in the back of your mind. The term transcriptome has considerably less popularity than does genomics or proteomics. We're going to talk about two different approaches, but we'll be emphasizing the first of these. The hybridization-based approach, which means that we're relying upon the production of hydrogen bonds between probe sequences and query sequences. Um, and when we get hybridization between the probe sequences on a, a microarray and a, uh, a, a, micro, uh, sorry, a messenger RNA from our sample, we get hybridization and we can measure them by fluorescence. So that's going to be the other key part of this. Our signal that comes out of this is based on fluorescent intensity of cDNA that's, that's, um, uh, that's, that's, been, that's had this dye added to it. Likewise, in sequencing-based approaches, we're not going to be doing this hybridization thing. Instead, we're going to be building complementary sequences via a sequencer. Again, from cDNA, we're going to have a little bit more to say about that in a minute. So instead of having an intensity to give us an abundance value for a, a transcript, we're going to have a read count to work from, a count of how many reads hit this particular messenger RNA. So cDNA, I don't want to slide that one in past you. The cDNA is actually something that matters a fair bit. Messenger RNA is really twitchy. If you, uh, if you uh, have RNA on your fingertips, it's not going to last long because your skin has enough uh, RNA on it to digest up anything that it touches. So being able to preserve the messenger RNA signal requires that we build DNA from it. So this is in the opposite order of how we normally think about transcription, right? We think about transcription as a process by which we build messenger RNA or pre-mRNA from DNA. But in this case, we're going in reverse. We have messenger RNAs, and now we're going to produce complementary DNA to it. So our goal here is to do this before the RNA, got, uh, the RNA uh, molecules have broken down irretrievably. 
So this is always a pretty early step in these, in these uh, experiments. In a eukaryote, in a eukaryote like us, does a cDNA match exactly the DNA that we have for a particular gene? We've got to no. know. Why do you say no? Right. In the in motion in the motion from pre mRNA to final mRNA to, to mature, I guess is what they were calling it in that slide. We removed some information from the transcript, and by splicing out those introns, we produced a mature RNA that no longer has part of the the gene from which it was derived. So, producing a cDNA from a eukaryotic uh, mature mRNA is not going to give you the full sequence of the gene. It's going to contain the spliced version of that gene. Good observation. All right, so in some cases, the amount of RNA that you get from a collection of cells is not that great. And so we sometimes make use of polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to exponentially increase the amount of sample that we have. But I want you to remember that at the end of the day, transcriptomics is a quantitative technology. And whenever you have an exponential amplification in an experiment like this, some of the quantitative information gets distorted because some sequences will, co will by random chance, uh, produce more copies than others will, even if they're present at the same number. So we, we, we can do the cDNA processing by using a primer on the messenger RNA. That primer is then extended to produce a cDNA, which has a sort of hookback, and a step of PCR will generate, um, will generate more copies of these cDNA duplexes for us to work with. Okay. I've used some images from Wikipedia here. So when you see something like Wikipedia JPARC 623, that's, that's the author uh, on Wikipedia or generally Wikimedia Commons who produce these. Most of the images that you see on Wikipedia have been made available for free use by anybody, but it's still appropriate to mention who you got this image from. I didn't draw it, I want you to know that. My drawings generally look a lot worse. So, we're now gonna talk about two different kinds of DNA microarrays. These uh, microarrays were produced by two different labs more or less simultaneously, two people who saw just how valuable this technology could be. So Stephen Fodor is one of them, and Edward Southern is the other. Has anyone heard the name Edward Southern? Edward Southern? It's kind of an unusual last name, isn't it? Southern Blood. It is. So the guy who gave us Burroughs Wheeler, the Bur Burroughs Wheeler algorithm, also gave us the subroutine. And here we see that Edward Southern also gave us the Southern Blot. Who knew, right? Cool. So there are two major kinds of microarrays that I want to talk about. Um, I used to have a slide that explained that microarrays were a Cartesian grid of probes. But you know, people don't know the name Cartesian. They don't know where Cartesian comes from. Does anyone in the room know that? Cartesian. What? Uh, no, no, it doesn't come from the, the Cartesian map. No. Descartes. René Descartes, very nice, yes. Yes, René Descartes uh, created the system that we all use. Do, do people not know the name R René Descartes? Oh, he's a hero of mine. <laughs> That's all right. No, no points off for, for not knowing René Descartes, it's okay. But uh, René Descartes created a system that we call Cartesian coordinates. Now, that still may not ring a, a, a bell with you, but most of us have used XY plots, mm -hmm. right? You've got the X axis here, you've got the Y axis there, and you have some ordered pair that fits somewhere on that, in that quadrant. So those were created by René Descartes. And so we have a Cartesian grid where you've got little addresses, one here, one here, one here, one here, in a whole row. And they're also in equal columns, so you have stripes of them in that direction as well. So at the intersection of vertical and horizontal lines, you have a probe on this microarray. But wait, how does the DNA get onto this Cartesian grid, onto this, onto this regular array of positions? 
That is where the, where the, the distinction grows between spotted and synthesized arrays. So here we see spotted or printed arrays, that's another name that we use for it, and synthesized arrays. All right, who here has had to deal with an inkjet printer? Inkjet printer, a few people, a few people. All right, who here has benefited from photolithography? Photolithography. It's taking pictures of rocks, isn't it? It's not, actually. It's not. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about photolithography in just a minute. We have all benefited from photolithography, most of us by a device hanging on our watches or in our pockets right now, unless someone gets a text. If it's really good, we'll share it with the room. So, photo, so we're going to talk about spotted and printed arrays because that's how we get the DNA on there. So in the case of spotted or printed arrays, this especially happens when someone wants to do a custom microarray we produce the DNA elsewhere that we're going to use to probe um, the, the, the different probes that we're going to use on this array. So we produce a whole bunch of these synthetic probes in the lab. We have freezers full of probe A and probe B and probe C. Maybe we've got them in you know, 384 well plates for that matter. We've got a huge number of them. And then we print, we spray a small amount of that DNA onto that particular spot of the microarray and repeat as needed, right? So if you have produced a microarray in your lab, it's probably on the order of hundreds of probes. If you do it through one of these manufacturers, it's probably a much larger number of probes because they have a much better ability to accurately deposit this probe on that particular minuscule spot of, of the glass. All right, synthesized arrays are, mean that the DNA features, the probes, are synthesized in situ on the substrate, in situ. So we use a lot of terms like this. We've got in silico and in vitro and so on. What about in situ? Uh, that's it. That's in vitro. Uh, sorry, in vivo. Sorry. No, that's that we usually call that in silico. Inside a cell. Uh, in in cellulo. I don't know. We don't use that one very often. Well, in situ means in the place itself. So we, we synthesize the DNA strands on the microarray itself. We grow, RNA, grow DNA right off the plate. It's a, a really magical little trick, and we're going to talk about how that works. There's a link, by the way. Uh, on, on the invention of the microarray. It's actually kind of a fascinating little tale, so I wouldn't want you to miss that. Not on the quiz, but it's still interesting. Okay, so photolithography. Uh, you guys may have had better exposure to your Greek roots, so I'm, I'm going to rely on you here. What's photo? Light. Light, very good. Litho. It does not have to do with electrons. Google to the rescue, quickly, quickly. Organic? Nope. Rocks. 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 Rocks it is. So we've got light, rocks, and Yes, light rock writing. <laughs> we are going to create on a rock substrate via light a DNA strand. This may seem totally bizarre to you, but in fact, photolithography is one of the most central technologies created in the 20th century. It's how we make microprocessors from silicon. So, photolithography is a huge, huge issue. So, I, I, I've got a diagram here, but I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to wave my hands a lot. I hope you don't mind. So, let us imagine that we have a piece of silicon. Now, I know what sequence I want at each of the spots here. This one is going to start with an A. This one's going to start with a C. This one also starts with an A, but it's going to have different le second letters than this other one. So, 
imagine that I have masked this whole surface. Now I am going uh, to add a, a primer to this surface that allows me to attach another letter of nucleotide. Okay, so I've, I'm functionalizing the surface to allow me to add new nucleotides directly to this surface. Here I believe this is shown by uh, a whole bunch of O's here, little oxygens, and they've got a mask on them, all right? So I, I've made my, my lower la layer, that includes the um, kind of a linker to let me build a first nucleotide, and on top of that I've painted a mask. Now, here comes the magic. We can make lasers that, sh that shine on very, very tiny patches of surface, measured in microns, right? Has anyone seen a, a, a microprocessor a micron measurement? You, you see that uh, this is a 45 micron process or a 12, 22 micron process. That relates to the size of the laser spots that we can create. So, in that case, I mean, we can, we can get below microns in, in the number of, uh, in the size of spots we create. So, my, I, I, the, first, uh, the first nucleotide that I'm going to add to this surface is going to be A, let's say. Now remember, I said that this first probe is going to start with A. The second probe is going to start with C. And this one is also going to start with A. So my laser shoots a hole in the where the first probe is going to be, and in the spot where the third probe is going to be. It does not shoot at the second probe, right? So by photo etching, I've blown the mask off of spot one and spot three, but not spot two. Now, I add a big lot of A to this, uh, to this surface. And any place that's been exposed by blowing away the mask, we add another nucleotide. Good so far? Now, I paint a mask over it all again. Now I'm going to add a C. Now, the next letter I want for probe 1 is not a C, it's a T. So I'm not going to shoot here. But the second, uh, the second probe is going to start with C, so I do etch here. The second letter I'm going to add to spot C does have a C as the next letter, so I shoot at that. So now I have spot 1 covered by mask, spots 2 and 3 not covered by mask. Now I add a big block of C to that surface. And the C sticks onto spots two and three. I'm doing this for all you know, million spots that I have on this array at once. This is really kind of magical. Then I apply mask, and once again I shoot off wherever I'm going to add, let's say, a T. Now I have a few places on this, on this surface uh, that have the mask burned off of them. I throw on a glob of T, let it attach, remask. And you keep doing this until you have a, a length of about 25 nucleotides on any one spot of that surface. This is how we make transistors for microprocessors. This is how we build sequence, uh, sequence probes on synthesized microarrays. Magical, absolutely magical. So, in the first case, in a spotted or printed array, we are spraying, like with an a inkjet printer, a little spot of DNA that we've manufactured elsewhere. In synthetic arrays, we build the probe right on the surface instead. All right, you're wrinkling a brow. Did you have a question about that? Yes, yeah, so what prevents the process from adding two of the same letter at the same time? So, so instead of just adding one A, two gets attached. I believe that the, the nucleotides that they add are blocked from additional um, uh, nucleotides being added until they've been masked and unmasked again. I'm not sure what the processing is there, but that's, that's an important thing. Uh, there's also, of course, the problem that if you don't do this very precisely, you may add a C to 75% of the probes at this, at this site but not the last 25, which means that you have different sequences all appearing in the same patch. So having very, very tight control on, uh, on you know, perfect uh, incorporation of all copies of the probe sequence at this location really, really matters. I 
think this is just magical, so I'm, I'm glad that you guys get exposed to it. But in general, the probes that we build on these, on these, uh, the, the probes of known sequence that we produce on these surfaces don't get longer than about 25 bases. That's long enough to be specific uh, to a bit of DNA. And we've seen that number before, haven't we? When we talked about KMERS, we were talking about stretches of sequence that were about 25 long as being sufficiently informative that they could be discriminated from each other. And in the same way, a 25 mer for a microarray probe is a pretty good length. Okay. So, how does the experiment go? This part you may already have had so much exposure to that you, you know it inside and out, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I'm going to go through it a bit for me to think about it too. So, we have a simple bench protocol for our DNA microarray experiments. I purchased a bunch of DNA microarrays. I bought one for each sample I was going to process. I have isolated messenger RNA from biological samples. I have reverse transcribed the messenger RNA to produce C DNA, complementary DNA. And I labeled that complementary DNA, this representing the experimental sample, by using a fluorescently labeled nucleotide. Or maybe I used biotin, or maybe I used whatever. You know, there are lots of ways that you can make a bit of DNA light up. I then hybridize the labeled cDNA to my DNA microarray. Hybridization works by what kind of bond? Hydrogen bond. Very good. Right down here. <laughs> so we can then wash to remove bits of DNA that didn't stick very specifically and scan the microarray looking for these little patches of light to quantify how much of my sample's cDNA annealed to the probes of the microarray. It's all pretty quick, isn't it? All right. Now, in the old days of microarrays, we were always talking about sample A versus sample B, and we would generally have one sample labeled in red and another sample labeled in green, and we would know that both of them had associated with a spot if we had a yellow patch. Generally speaking, microarrays are done at such a large scale today that each array applies to a different sample. So uh, this is another process, uh, one that relies upon biotin. This is taken from this uh, Schultz uh, paper. So having isolated messenger RNA, we create poly-T probes to produce, uh, uh, to uh, give us primers to build a complementary DNA strand. Along that way, we added a site for uh, the T7 DNA polymerase. We use that to stick on biotin labels. Those biotin labels, in turn, could be used to connect fluorescent tags. And so each array then has uh, one sample attributed to it, and we can ask how much intensity was seen for this probe on this sample. And we can do ratioing. We can look at this uh, individual feature and say, how much did the intensity change at this, at this particular probe in this cohort versus that cohort? There are all kinds of different purposes to which this can be put, though. And I want you to, uh, uh, I want you to think about the different ways in which these data get used. So, there's usually a virtuous cycle. Do people know the term virtuous cycle? A virtuous cycle means a feedback process that improves its, its, uh, its function at each passage. So we start, because we're, we're talking about the ideal, pure, all-knowing biologist. We start with a biological question. My goodness, why do my feet hurt when I wake up in the morning? OK, sometimes it's a more insightful question than that. But we have a biological question. From it comes an experimental design. From it, we decide to do some transcriptome profiling. We're going to do some microarrays. From this stage, everyone's going to have to do some amount of data pre-processing. This morning we used logarithms to, to uh, normalize the, the data that were coming from the microarrays. That is an example of data pre-processing. And then data mining comes. What does data mining mean? You know, in the old days, we would call this data mining. Today, we might call this a big data exercise. But that's OK. We'll, we'll leave this at data mining, which is a little bit dated as terms go. There are very many different ways that you can make use of these data, but we can start with differential expression. We have two cohorts. We want to know which genes differentiate those two cohorts. Clustering. 
Clustering is a very powerful technique that has been applied a whole lot in microarrays. Um, as time passes in this presentation, we'll talk about bi-clustering, a very important application. And we may want to do classification. We may want to learn what transcripts are characteristic of a certain subset of samples. From that, we must do biological interpretation. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that next Thursday in particular, when we talk pathways and networks. From that, we're able to generate hypotheses that are testable, which gives us the ability to do further experimental verification. And now, our biological questions have gotten refined because of the result from the first experiment. Virtuous cycle. So let's look at some of these, these processes at the lower right. So we're going to start with a little discussion of normalization and, and quality control. I hope you don't mind. Quality control is a real pet, pro pet project with me. So normalization. Why do we have to normalize our data? We normalize to remove systematic variation that would otherwise bias our measured gene expression levels. Experimenter bias. I talked about the good and noble and amazing uh, principal investigator who put together a biological question just a moment ago. But sometimes investigators are so sure of their hypothesis that they sort of slant their experiments in a way that might favor their results. Being able to deal with that in normalization is challenging. I, I would also, uh, so we'll, we'll move on to experiment conditions. What if you had a uh, what if you had some problems with power stability on one day out of a four-week set of experiments? Is it, is it going to change the nature of the data that came back on the power fluctuation day? Could. Certainly could. Sample preparation. Have you all had a little bit of time with, uh, with the pipette men? Do you get exactly the same five microliters every time when you run one of them? I have bad hands. I, I, I say this as somebody who knows firsthand how experimental variability happens. It comes because I breathe on the experiments, right? So, yeah, pipetting pipe errors and things like that can lead to small variations in the samples that get to, exposed to these experiments. Machine parameters. What if you had uh, ordered all of these microarrays that you're running against on, say, three different months? And some of them were from batch 784, and some were from batch 797, and some were from batch 815. What if there were subtle differences between those batch sets that caused them to behave differently in hybridization? That's a tough thing to control for. So we need to be able to be robust against machine parameters of that sort. We see that there have been a variety of methods out there that are published I know we, we kind of get biased to think we want the highest score we want on arbitrary scoring techniques, but I'm going to read this label for you. It says, standard deviation between replicates. Standard deviation between replicates. Would you want a high or a low standard deviation between replicates? Low. We want it to be very low. We want to have a low coefficient of variation uh, among these. We want to have a low standard deviation between replicates. So here we see a comparison for MAS5, DCHIP, and RMA. These are three methods that have been put forward for normalization. And we see that RMA gives one of the most robust uh, reductions in standard deviation for this method. We also spent a little time this morning looking at the, um, at the box plots showing the microarray uh, intensities across these samples. And we saw some amount of raggedness there. They didn't all have quartiles that matched up equally well across the cohorts. So being able to do normalization is valuable. Now, when I was in grad school, people would always talk about the housekeeping genes. Maybe they had five genes that they think all cells should have in operation at the same level all the time, no matter what cellular processes are taking place. Therefore, Having taken the five intensities associated with these five housekeeping genes, they have something they can divide all the measurements by to keep them normalized on the same level. This sounds like a good idea, but in fact, it falls apart almost every time. If you have to rely on normalization, 
we really advise against the use of housekeeping genes as a way to standardize. Just the reality of the thing. It hasn't held up well when people have looked at it. What if we could force all of them to have the same mean? Right, so over here, we see what the, the, in, the distributions of all intensities for all genes look like across these eight microarrays. We can, we can figure out what multiplier we need to apply to force all of these to have the same median, or the same mean, for that matter. That's an example of global normalization, using a scaling factor to force all the means or medians to the same place. You can even do some very aggressive methods that will shape the data so they all are distributionally identical. And that is, that's pretty crazy. So the, the top gene by expression is, is not changed in this, but as a whole, the data are mapped so that there's no difference in the maximum and the minimum and the medians that we've seen for all of these uh, data. So quantile normalization is quite aggressive in changing the shape of the data so that it is maintained perfectly across all of the samples. The MA plot is something that you should also know about. An MA plot gives us the ability to ask, how does the, in the intensity of the signal affect its bias? So what we have is a log average intensity. So 16 is a really high intensity, and 8 is a really small intensity. So this. This range right here, if you're on a log base 2 scale, is 2 to the 8th wide, which is to say this would be 256, where this is 1. That's a, that's a really big uh, expansion of, of, uh, of, of space. So massively intense signals, very low signals. We talked about FC this morning, log FC. Does anyone remember what that stood for? Full change. Yes, who said that? Is it you? No, what's over there? Thank you. Yes, full change. That was Hannah who said that. See, I've learned your name. I'm getting better. All right. So here we see full change as well. The vertical position of a dot tells us, and I should say, each of these dots represents a different probe on this chip. So we're just looking at one chip at, at, at the moment. Sorry, at, 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 let's say two chips at a time right now. We see that this probe right here is up between these two sets of chips. Uh, and it's kind of a middling intensity. But what if we see something like uh, an eyebrow here? Maybe it's nice and level at low intensities, but suddenly curves downward as we get to higher intensities. Sort of a curve like that. That's bad news, because that means that you have systematic variation in your data, where one of them is measuring high intensities much better than the other is. So, we expect that, on average, all of the genes are going to stay pretty consistent. But if, if instead we see that there's a whole bias that all intense signals uh, have a full change in the direction of one cohort rather than the other, we're concerned about that. So MA plots give us the ability to measure that. Bi-clustering is one of those methods that uh, has become almost synonymous with the, the figures you expect to see in a microarray data set. This is called a, a checkerboard pattern. So the, uh, this technique was first uh, put forward in the year 2000 by Cheng and Church. Uh, George Church is the guy behind the, uh, the Thousand Genomes Project, so he's a, a really big figure in the, in the world of molecular biotechnology. So here we have different cell lines, and you can see that they called some of these yellow cell lines, a few of them black cell lines, some blue, some red. Here, we have a list of genes. And in this case, we're going to uh, eliminate from consideration any gene that has very little variation across samples. So with this set of uh, approximately 1,000, it's a little more than 1,000 genes, we are able to ask which genes uh, are, are related in the patterns of expression that they see. So here we see a pile of genes. Oh, I always forget which one is up. Is it red or is it green? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, we'll just call red up for now. I'm sorry, I should know this. 
I also, I would also point out, if you're making a major scientific visualization, please try not to use red and green. There are lots of guys who cannot tell the difference between red and green of, this, of these shades. These plots are nightmares for them. So, you know, if you're going to pick a major visualization, try something like a purple-yellow or something like that, something that more guys can actually read. It's all right. Just a weakness in our, in our genes. So, here we are sorting together those genes that have the most similar patterns of expression across these samples. So these, we're going to say, are up in this set of samples. These are down uh, in those samples. So these, these genes are up on the one side, down on the other. That, causes, that means that there's a lot of covariance or a lot of, a lot of correlation among them. These, these genes get sorted together. At the same time, we look for which samples have patterns of expression across genes that are most similar. So you can think of this as, a, as, an, as an unsupervised way for us to sort the data and see if the data are, uh, if any of these data are, are useful in discerning one class from another. And this checkboard uh, pattern that comes out is one of the, the examples from that. I, I grabbed this particular example from a paper that has this DOI, so if you want to see it in action, that's one way to do it. There are some really great algorithms out there for doing bi-clustering as well. Many of them are found in our friend, bio, uh, the Bioconductor Libraries. All right. So what are we going to try to accomplish through this? We, we uh, showed a slide a few turns back where we talked about the goals that we seek in these experiments. So I'm going to break these down to class comparison, class detection, and class prediction. So we start with the fact that uh, in, in the first case, we know that there are different subtypes of breast cancer, for example. We've got HER2 positive, we've got triple negative, we've got blah, blah, blah. This set of possible uh, type, subtypes of that cancer. So one of the things we might ask is, how does gene expression tally with our foreknowledge of the fact that these, that, these, uh, that these types of cancers are different from each other? I've got a class A cancer, a class B cancer, a class C cancer. I want to see if gene expression is something that helps us to understand the differences among them. So that's class comparison. We typically use differential expression analysis, which we're going to go into. Uh, we did an example of it earlier today. Our input is the gene expression data, what the microarray has to tell us, and information we provide that says this sample is a, an example of type A, or this example is of type B. And the output will be a subset of genes that are found to be differential, genes that change um, in response to the classes, we, the class information we have provided. Okay, it's three o'clock. I still have an hour. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna run this over. Class detection. Which samples are similar? So in this case, maybe I have a whole bunch of colon cancers, and it's not entirely clear to me how these samples, these samples within uh, the set, uh, are similar to each other. You know, I can say, well, these, these two tumors both came from people in their 70s, and these came from folks in their 40s, so maybe that should make them different. I don't know. But sometimes we let the data tell us how these samples compare to each other. So in, in effect, we can use cell ex uh, gene expression data to inform us how these samples divvy up into subgroups, into subpopulations. So we start with clustering analysis. We talked about bi-clustering just a moment ago. The input is just gene expression data. None of our own insights about which samples or what types goes into this. But at the output, we have groups of similar samples and groups of genes that make those the samples. OK. Are people holding together? People are holding together? Mm -hmm. It's Friday afternoon. Some of us are a little sleepy. <laughs> I'm a little sleepy, too. I'm going to finish this slide, though, because it's a really important slide. All right. Finally, class prediction. Are we able to identify signatures, call them biomarkers, sets of small sets of genes that are, that are canaries in the coal mine for us, that are able to tell us what subtype this patient falls into? 
This is something that we're very interested in when we try to decide which household contacts of, of people with tuberculosis are most likely to get sick with tuberculosis themselves. Are there particular gene expression patterns that are associated with this propensity to get tuberculosis when being near someone who has it? So, for this, we're going to use machine learning. Do you know who our local expert is on machine learning? It's not me. I I'm always a little suspicious of machine learning. Gerard Trump is a real expert in this space. So if you ever find yourself needing to use class prediction, he is your best friend. Man will give you his kidney, he's amazing. All right, so machine learning techniques. You're going to need a training set. So in this case, we're going to need a bunch of microarrays for people before that we knew were being exposed to tuberculosis, but before we knew whether they were uh, actually coming down with it or not. The output is a prediction model that lets us test, a, given, given a new sample from somebody who uh, just learned that somebody in their household has tuberculosis, we can use this model to test that certain subset of genes in the signature to determine whether or not they are likely highly at risk. Okay, so these are the kinds of things people go after with gene expression studies. I, I hope that this is useful to you in sort of separating out these purposes. We're going to talk some math, and we're going to talk some statistics, and it's bloody important stuff. This, this is, a, the, the next part that we're going to talk about is the thing I want you to understand above anything else that I have rattled on about today. So, I'm going to ask us all to take no more than a five minute break, and when we come back, we're all going to have our best listening ears together because it's so bloody important and stuff. All right? So I'll see you all in five minutes. Yeah. Oh, I guess I should start the recording. Okay. This is a matrix. It is a matrix in which we have three samples of cohort HNE0 and three columns where we have HNE60. Each of these is called a gene, but it's a probe, actually, in this case. We have a different genetic probe that represents a patch of uh, probe sequences on the surface of the microarray. And here, we have some carefully normalized value that's reported for each array and for each probe. In general, we will apply statistical testing, statistical hypothesis testing, on each of these probes independently. We have a null hypothesis. Everyone remember null hypotheses in H sub zero? The null hypothesis tells us that we expect no difference in the means between these two samples. But we have an alternative hypothesis that covers the whole search space of everything else, which is to say the mean for cohort one is not the same as the mean for cohort two. We're going to use the t-test then to evaluate the probability that we would see this set of intensities if in fact there were no intensity, there were no difference between the means. Okay, so we've got a test for this row, a test for that row, a test for that row, a test for that row. So are these two groups from a single distribution, or do they represent, or are the red and green ones different distributions? So students t-test is based on the idea that the variation we see within a, a within these data is normal in nature. Remember normal curves, right? We've got our, our mean our, our mean, we have a standard deviation that talks about how wide it is. So standards t-test assumes that variation is going to look like that normal distribution. The Mann-Whitney U-test is also a test to evaluate whether they come from one distribution or not. But it's non-parametric. Non-parametric in this case means that we do, not, uh, we do not assume that the variation follows one of these nice, comfort comfortable patterns like the normal distribution. So Mann-Whitney is more robust, but students' T-test is somewhat more efficient it's able to use the information a little bit better than the U-test scan. So there are two examples that I've drawn out here. This is a, these are data from uh, Bing Zhang's slide, actually. So 
I'm going to read these numbers off because I realize they appear quite small. On the left for gene X, we have 961, 1103, and 10.5. So pretty closely distributed numbers. On the right, we have 11.44, 12.23, and 13.61. If we compare those three, statistics, those three values to three values using t-test, we get a p-value of 0.06. But we get a u-test p-value of 0.1. So they're, they're producing different results here. What happens when we change just one of those values from, say, 13.6 to 25.6? Suddenly, t-test's p-value escalates very, very rapidly. This is from changing a single point, because now this, uh, the amount of variation that we have within one of these cohorts is much higher. 20, uh, sorry, changing this 13.6 to a 25.61 really distorts the variability for one set of these samples. The p-value from the, the u-test, however, is unchanged, because to it, that value was already the highest across these six, and just because it moved from 13.6 to 25.6, didn't change the fact that it was the top-ranked value out of those six. This is an example of robustness against outliers. So, um, right. We're going to look into this a little more closely, though. I hope you feel comfortable reading our code, because we're going to do a little bit of it. This is really bad code because I wrote it, but I hope that it's going to be simple that you can follow it. So we're going to start with testing these tests. I'm going to make up data for a thousand different trials of t-test and u-test. I'm going to use different means. I'm going to have uh, A be drawn from a mean equals 4 population and B will be drawn from a mean equals 6 population. So in this case, we know that these distributions really are different. Because I didn't specify it, R is going to assume that the standard deviation that I want is 1. So we expect that 70% of the data seen for, uh, seen for A are less than 5, and we know that 70% of the data for B should be, less, should be greater than 5. So there's not a whole lot of mixing between these two distributions. And for a thousand different sets of numbers, I'm going to generate five replicates for cohort A and five replicates for cohort B. So does this make sense to everyone, what I'm doing? I'm just going to compare. I'm going to do a five-on-five t-test and using the same data, a five-on-five u-test. And I'm going to repeat this 1,000 times. All right. So for this, I'm creating an array called t-vals that represents the p-values derived from the stu from student's t-test. u-vals is going to receive the Wilcoxon test instead. This is the Man Whitney Wilcoxon u test. It goes by lots of names. So what we're going to ask is how do these distributions of p-values differ from each other across 1,000 trials? This plot shows us this. Has anyone ever used accumulation, uh, sorry, a cumulative distribution function plot? Okay, essentially a CDF sorts all of the values that came out, so sorting all of the t-test values that we generated across these thousand trials from the lowest value up to the highest value. Everyone has that. And then it's going to plot them ranging from zero up to one. So by, it's going to get the lowest p-values first, and by the time it shows the entire curve way out here somewhere, it has accounted for all of the data, the maximum value. That's, the, that's where you get the 1. So here we are looking at the, what fraction, essentially, of, the, of, the t, uh, of these values fall below this blue line, which is set at 0.05. So what we're saying is that in this case, I'm going to draw this little line right here. Approximately, say, 75% of the t-tests produced a, a positive, a, a significant claim. In 75% in of these t-tests, we were given a significant p-value for distributions that we knew were different. 
How does that change if I knock this to, say, 7 on 7 or 10 on 10? Are we able to distinguish more often or less often if I increase the number of replicates? More often, yes. The more samples that we have, the better our ability to tell the difference between real, uh, truly different distributions. So if I drop this to three, our ability to detect truly different distributions drops. It plummets, in fact. But when we have five values versus five values, 80% of the time, I can tell the difference between these two means with a standard deviation of one. Is that true for the U-test? What we see is that there's this very different behavior in the U-test. You see how that red line moves in stair steps? There's a reason for that. So let us imagine that I have five values from A and five values from B. I might have all of my values of A below all of my values from B. Okay. That is the best I can possibly do in U-test. And it doesn't matter if they're spread wide or narrowly. So long as all of the A's are below all of the B's, U-test is going to give the same p-value. So that's why you see, in effect, a whole lot of ties here. These ties are happening because at this point, there's no inter inter uh, interdigitation of these two distributions. Now, what happens as soon as the highest A value is higher than the lowest B value, right? This is a high value, this is a low value. Now our low distribution is interdigitated with the high distribution. Whether this highest value is very close to, this, to the second lowest or very close to the lowest value doesn't matter in terms of U-test. But this, the fact that suddenly the highest value of this is higher than the lowest value of this means that we suddenly step up to a higher p-value. So what we see is that we have this, uh, this jump. Uh, sorry, th this is the, uh, the first p-value that we get out of U-test. We see that something like oh, around 1%, uh, sorry, that a p-value of uh, 0.1 happens just a little bit less than 40% of the time. As soon as we have one interdigitation, a mix uh, it, that where the A and B distributions overlap, we suddenly get a big stair step upward that reflects a drop in the p-value. And that starts accounting for more and more of these data. So in a five-on-five -five comparison with this real difference to be found, we see that the t-test is giving us about 75% significant differences, and the u-test is giving us more like 65%. All right. So there is a cost in efficiency for using the U-test. They can produce the same p-value, but unless you have five or more uh, samples in each cohort, your ability to use U-test is going to be diminished. All right. Now, this is quite different than the t-test that we frequently see used in microarray data analysis. This morning, we saw that lemma was a, uh, the linear models of uh, microarrays, um, was used in, uh, as a library for the geo to R code when we looked at the gene expression omnibus. Do you remember, I had you look through the source code behind the, uh, the analysis we did this morning. And you remember seeing e -bays, and you remember seeing Lima. All right, so Lima is the library that gave us access to the e -bays t t-test. And the e t t-test is different than students' t-test. It's not even the same as the Welch modification of variance for a t-test. So e is a very widely used method for making sense of microarray data. And one of the reasons is that it uses a moderated t-statistic test. There's something really, really important you need to understand about why Lemma's eBay's t-test is rather different from the, t -t the student's t-test. And it is that the way it measures variance is completely different than the way that it is done in student's t-test. 
Imagine the scenario where you have three values from A and three values from B. How accurate, well, how, how, uh, how much error do you think there is in your estimate of the mean from cohort A or from cohort B? You've got three values. Do you feel that you know the mean very, very accurately for those three values? The answer to the second question is actually different than the first. When you have three values, your ability to compute the mean from them is exact. The mean for these three values is the value of the sum divided by three. End of story. However, if you did, had done five experiments instead of three, your measurement of the mean for the population from which those are drawn would become much more accurate. Okay? So there's a difference between this mean that we can compute from the values we observed and the mean of the population from which they are drawn. Do you think that if I generate three samples from A, from this mean, this mean four collection, that I'm going to get a mean value of four? Probably not. Maybe it'll be as low as 3.5 or maybe it'll be as high as 4.9 for that matter. So the mean that we compute from our, our samples is not the same as the mean from the population. It is an estimate of the sample population mean. OK, I'm glad you got that. So the next problem is that of variance. Our estimate of variance really, really suffers when we have a small number of samples. So you really have to have enough data there in order to get a good bearing on variance. So if you, if you overestimate the variance in a t-test, you're, you're going to be less prone to producing a significant t-test, a, a, a significant p-value that comes out of it. If you underestimate the variance, you're going to have the opposite problem, that things are going to look more significant than they really are. And variance is very inaccurate when we have small numbers of samples. This is the problem that we address through using the empirical Bayes moderated t-test. It's a long name, isn't it? We can just call it eBayes if we like, but that's the, this is the thing. So the moderated t-statistic then is moderated because it is using a more accurate estimate of overall variance by using data across all the genes all the genes to figure out how much variance we're really seeing. This is far more accurate in estimating variance than the num simply looking at the three values versus three values that we might have for a small experiment. So using the variant esti a variance estimate derived from all of the genes gives us a much more successful measurement of variance. And thus, the p-values that come out of the t-test are ones that are more reliable than if we had used the variance for just this one gene. OK, does everyone get that? All right, that's good. So we call this a t-test. It is a t-test. It is checking to see if the means are the same. It's generating t-statistics in roughly the same way. It's just the input about how the variance is estimated differs. OK. So. This brings us to the fine topic of multiple testing correction. Here we have another table provided by Bing. HNE 0, 1, 2, and 3. HNE 60, 1, 2, and 3. Each row gets its very own t-test. Its very own t-test. And those t-tests are independent of each other unless they're moderated, in which they all have the same variance input. So each of these rows gets tested independently. Therefore, we need multiple testing correction. So, if there are no differences that are real, can we still detect differences? Again, I'm going to have you read some of my R code. This time we're going to do a thousand trials, and we're going to model a thousand different microarrays, oh, sorry, a thousand different microarray trials uh, for, for a, a microarray that has 10,000 genes on it. All right, this is a small microarray, just 10,000 genes. And we're going to test 1,000 times over the, those 10,000 genes. In each case, we are going to compute a 5 versus 5 comparison. This R norm means give me five numbers from a normal distribution. What is the mean difference between these two variables in this case? 
reading my heart good. What mean is it using when I run the R norm function? What's that? Uh, no, that is the number of samples that I get back from it, actually. That's a, a good thing to, to clarify. So A is a vector of five values drawn from one normal distribution. It's using the default parameters in this case for defining what that, what that, uh, that distribution looks like. So the mean, I believe, is zero, and the standard deviation is one. Is there a difference in the means and standard deviations between A and B? No, they're derived exactly the same way from exactly the same distribution. So again, we have a five on five test, but this time, no difference whatsoever between the two distributions. The samples may be different, but they're drawn from the, the truly, the population here has exactly the same distribution, exactly the same mean, exactly the same standard deviation. So for each of my trials, I am going to run five A's and five B's in 10,000 genes. And each time, I'm going to create this, this, uh, this vector of all of the p-values that came back for my 10,000 genes. And then for each, each trial, I'm going to ask how many of these genes were hits, and I'm going to use the ordinary old rule. I'm going to say, if it produced a p-value of less than 0.05, it's a significant hit. All right? So, I've done 10,000 genes. These are uncorrected p-values. I'm not even doing the eBase thing. I'm just doing ordinary old boring t-test, and I'm grabbing out the p-values. So, now I'm going to ask, how many positives did I have for this trial out of 1,000? And at the left, I'm plotting the, plotting the histogram of those. So having done 10,000 t-tests of the exact same distributions, I was able to find about 450 positives by random chance alone when I knew the distributions were the same. I want you to internalize that because I want to protect you from misunderstanding your own data at some point in your lives. There's no real difference here, but the software is able to find differences by random chance alone. In fact, this is less frequently finding differences than I would expect it to. Because we say, when there are no real differences, the p-values should be uniformly distributed between one, 0 and 1, which would mean that the fraction that would be uh, falsely positive is what? The fraction of all tests that should uh, that should show up as positive by random chance is what? 5%. 5%. So 1 in 20 of these genes that we test should be called significant, even though we know that none of them are. So this number does not uh, hit 500 in my particular test. It showed up at about 450. By the way, if you try to run this code, expect your laptop to be occupied for about 30 minutes <laughs> doing Doing 1,000 tests of 10,000 genes does take a while uh, to, to run. So here we see that we've got about 5% uh, about of all of these results turning up positives even when we know none of them are real. This is our argument that we must have multiple testing correction for these p-values to be interpretable. Otherwise, you're going to be producing plenty of false positives just by random chance alone. So, Multiple testing correction has lots of different answers to it. I'm going to just talk about the two most popular ones, popular being you know, some measure uh, that, that it doesn't exist in statistics, but we have two different models that we frequently use. We've already talked about one when we talked about Manhattan plots. We figure out how many different tests we're going to do, num trials. We plug in a threshold that we wanted to achieve, 0.05 in this case, and that gives us a new p-value threshold that we can test all of our p-values against. If you use this, you're going to get uh, a, a, a severe curtailment in how many genes you call differential. But I want you to remember what it's trying to do. It's trying to protect you against making any errors. 
So if you're going to spend the next year of your life chasing after some gene, I want you to know that you must protect yourself against a false positive. Make sure that that gene can pass your criterion here. Next, what if we are okay with some subset of our, different, of our significant differences being not truly significant? What if we could accept, for example, that 5% of our significant hits were actually bogus? We would be a lot more sensitive to measuring the real differences if we, if we can go that route. So Benjamin and Hochberg have put together a, an approach that allows us to limit the rate at which false positives accumulate. And it, it's kind of a counterintuitive and odd situation, but I'm going to try to guide you through it here. Imagine that we sort all of the genes that we've tested on this microarray in order of p-value. The very lowest p-value, the second lowest p-value, the third lowest p-value, on out to 10,000. In each case, we're going to gradually increase the threshold that we must apply at each step. So this is the way that you would compute the threshold that is applied to just that first gene, the one that had the most significant looking p-value. Then we use a slightly higher threshold for number two, and a slightly higher threshold for number three. At the point where you cross over that line, you're done. That's the set that you should use to represent your, your minimal set that has a known, an, expect, an estimated rate of false positives. In practice, you see a lot more Benjamini Hochberg out there than you do Bonferroni. That's in large part because a lot of people will say, well, it ate my data. I had a bunch of hits and now I don't. So let us talk, real talk, about multiple testing correction. These are all things that I've heard from people. Um, I'm not going to name names about people who've whined in some way or another about multiple testing correction. But lots of people don't like it because it takes away their stuff. So let us start with the number one. All of my hits vanished after I used multiple testing correction. We're going to have a little moment where we talk about the philosophy of science. Maybe the null distribution was correct. Maybe there really was no difference in gene expression between cells of this type and cells of that type. We do the experiment to test these hypotheses, and sometimes our hypotheses are wrong. Sometimes we, we run into these experiments with expectations that are not in fact met by the biology. When you are a very, very senior investigator, and you're very accustomed to having your way in everything, and everyone agrees with you, you must be right, that's when you have to be most careful to protect yourself. Our ideas about what an experiment, our predictions about what an experiment should show us, can sometimes be wrong. And the null distribution is real. Sometimes we must accept that the experiment did not produce any significant differences. Okay? Next, maybe your experiment was underpowered. How many of us have done a three-on-three -three test, right? We've done a, we, we did three replicates because we were told that we couldn't do t-test without three replicates, so that's exactly what we did. Replicate A, B, C over here. Replicate A, B, C over here. Now we've compared these two distributions, and we didn't get any hits. Well, maybe the variability of measurement was so great that any biological effect we wanted to measure was invisible. Maybe we really needed seven or eight or nine replicates, not three, before these real biological differences would show up. So sometimes you just need a better experiment, one that is sufficiently powered to find the effects that you are modeling. It's the reality of things. Next, this is another really poisonous one. Dr. X published without multiple testing correction. So why do I have to do it? There are a world of, of people in our field who have talked to one person on Earth who told them they didn't need multiple testing correction. And they decide they're not going to do it because one person told them what they wanted to hear. You will see people publishing all the time uh, that this result was
trending towards significance, that this was almost significant. And these are weasel words. Weasel, weasel words. And I would hit them with this stick repeatedly. In the beginning, you set your data analysis strategy, and then you stick with it. Don't keep poking at the data in hopes that one of them will somehow, oh, well, if I switch to, one si to a one-sided t-test, and if I use this variance calculation and so on, now I get a, a significant value. Don't do this. Figure out what your strategy should be at the beginning, and stick with it. There are lots of people who write wrong things about statistics. Just because it's what you want to hear does not mean it's OK. Statisticians cry a lot. They really, really do. They cry because people publish conceited, ignorant things that they shouldn't do. All right. I did five groups of samples, so I just compared between each pair of groups. So I had A, I had B, I had C, I had D, and I had E. And I had five replicates in each. It's a great study, right? But then I compared all of the A's to all of the B's to look for significant findings. Then I compared all of the A's to all of the C's to look for significant findings. And then all of the A's to all of the D's, all of the A's to all of the E's, B's to C's, B's to D's, B's to E's, C's to D's, C's to E's, D's to E's. Wasn't that great? No, it was terrible. It was terrible. We're right back in the handshake problem. If you've got five different groups, there are 10 different pairwise comparisons you can do. It's disastrous. Disastrous. Do a bloody ANOVA. That's what they're for. OK, so be careful that you don't create multiple, multiple testing corrections by over comparing your data. There are ways to avoid that. Talk to a statistician. I'm going to have a brief moment where we step away from the hard sciences and spend a little time with our economics friends. Ronald Coase had a very wise observation. If you torture the data long enough, it will confess. <laughs> There's hardly an experiment out there that you can't torture into giving you the result you want by adding this transform and maybe adding an offset and ruling out that data set that looks kind of hinky. You can do stuff like that. And you will eventually get your data to give you some significant gene or some significant protein. That doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. Don't torture your data. All right, that brings us to the ubiquitous volcano plot. We talked about these this morning. In fact, we made kind of an ugly looking one using Excel. This represents the two kinds of data points that we get for each gene in a data set. So we have the negative log p value on one axis. Remember, mine was turned on the side. This is how it should look. We have a negative log p value on this scale. So higher means much lower p value. Remember, it's negative log. And we have the log base 2 full change here. So something on the zero line means that this gene doesn't change at all. All right, so when you look at these, you are going to have uh, kind of a line that you can imagine drawn right through here, and a line drawn right through here. Let's say that these lines are at log base two, of, uh, well, they're, they're at one right here. So this line is separating things that don't change very much to be, bio, uh, that, so they must not be biologically significant, and things on this side that are found to be different in, in, the, in one direction. So these, are, these genes on the, on the left are things that are um, maybe high in the control. And these things that are falling outside it to the right are genes that are high in the cases. Next, I want you to imagine another line drawn right across here. So things below this line do not achieve significant p-values. And things above this line do produce significant p-values. So in effect, we have six regions within this plot. Things that are at significant p-values and low full changes. Things that are significant p-values and high full changes. These things in the middle don't change enough, even though they have significant p-values. 
these things down here all have two low significant two uh, two low p values for us to consider cons uh, consider looking at. So these these plots show up everywhere, and anyone who's working with high throughput data in, the, in a diff trying to differentiate cohorts is likely to generate one at some point in his/her life. All right. There are lots of ways that we can talk about this RNA seq versus microarray question. I want to note that we've just spent a whole lot of time on this side, and, and there's a lot that one can say about what you can find from RNA seq. Probably the number one thing that would really compel you to use RNA seq rather than microarrays is that you're trying to measure gap junctions. You're trying to evaluate what set of isoforms from the set of possible ones for each gene could be produced. Something like a microarray is not very well designed for that purpose. So, our result is not limited to expression when we do RNA-seq. These data are much more versatile for us to work with. On expression, we can quantify expression on both the exon and the gene level. It's kind of exciting, right? Think about uh, being able to say how frequent each exon is, not just the gene itself. You can do that with microarrays. There are some microarrays designed around exons as the center point, and they can also pull stunts of this sort. You will only be able to detect unknown sequences, though, via RNA-seq. Microarrays have some limited set of probes, and if, it, if you don't have a probe for it, you can't measure it. The analysis for RNA-seq is worlds more difficult. We talked about it a little bit this morning in the practical when we looked at the galaxy, uh, the galaxy uh, uh, pipeline for making sense by, by uh, the tuxedo set uh, for RNA-seq data sets. Dealing with microarray data, on the other hand, is easy. Even if you don't like bioinformatics at all, you can probably work your way through a microarray data analysis. The interpretation is similarly quite difficult on RNA-seq. You're probably going to pay quite a lot more to do sequencing, but the price is dropping so rapidly with RNA-seq that everybody's getting into doing it. The data cost is something you should think about, though. You're going to want to keep copies of these data around, and you can write your, a large number of, of uh, microarrays off to a CD, whereas you're going to need a lot of DVDs to store out a whole lot of sequencing data if you go that route. Data maintenance becomes a bigger issue on this side as well. So I've, uh, I've included a slide here, uh, sorry, a, a link down here to talk about how quantities differ as we start looking at read counts rather than intensity from uh, fluorescence. Uh, but we're not really going to discuss it as a part of the lecture itself. We have some takeaway messages because every slide, uh, every lecture show must have its takeaway messages. So first, hybridization-based arrays by microarray are rapidly seeding ground to high throughput sequencing methods for gene expression measurement. People want the ability to go hunting for novel details when they do their gene expression studies. And that means that as sequencing prices have dropped, people have fallen more and more readily into running those and making sense of those. Um, that's not to say microarrays are going away. The, the, sales, uh, the sales in microarrays continue to, to grow, frankly. So I don't think that microarrays are going to go away. They're just not going to be considered as bleeding edge. High throughput sequencing data places considerably more load on bioinformatics for interpretation than does Sanger sequencing. Um, but it offers far greater richness. That what, what you can find from an RNA-seq set is just much more diverse. Plots to visualize data quality and key measures of performance are vital to understanding complex issues that can crop up in these experiments. We use, we use these visualizations because humans are notoriously bad at looking at large tables. Make use of visualizations that exist, like the MA plot, to be able to recognize potential sources of bias in your data. All right, and with that, we come to the weekend yes. at 3.50, 3.47 p.m. We will have a quiz on Monday. Uh, some people will actually be taking two quizzes for those who missed today's. Uh, I hope they get better uh, first and foremost. But at 9.30 on Monday, we will have a fresh, fresh quiz for you based out of the slides and the, the, the uh, practical this morning. But I, will, I hope you all have a brilliant weekend. We've, we're halfway through bioinformatics, folks. Well done.